BBC World Service. This is Helena Merriman with The Inquiry. This week, Cuba's new relationship with the US. What would Che say? On December the 17th last year, an American named Alan Gross left a Cuban prison, boarded a US military plane, ate a corned beef sandwich and took a phone call from President Obama. Later that day, the president revealed what was going on. Today, the United States of America is changing its relationship with the people of Cuba. Mr. Gross had been part of a prisoner swap, the culmination of 18 months of secret negotiations to ease generations of tension between the US and Cuba, two countries divided by ideology, history, and less than 150 kilometers of water. We will begin to normalize relations between our two countries. In Cuba, celebrations. But from its president, Raul Castro, caution. No debe pretenderse que para mejorar las relaciones con los Estados Unidos. Improving ties with the US, he says, doesn't mean that Cuba will abandon the ideas for which it's fought for more than a century. But as Cuba builds a new relationship with the US, can it hang on to its founding socialist principles? Principles associated with one man in particular. Cuba's revolutionary father, Che Guevara. Or, to put it another way, what would Che say? Part 1. Che's Revolution. He's the soul of Cuba. He is the spirit of a nation. It's incredible. He's everywhere. This is Lucia Alvarez de Toledo, someone who loves to talk about Che. I've been called Che Guevara on tap because at the slightest provocation, it all comes out. I want to do him justice. I want him to be known for what he was and who he was and as he was. She's written a biography about him called The Story of Che Guevara. It covers everything. His motorcycle journeys across South America, his role in the Cuban government, all the way back to his upbringing in an Argentinian house just around the corner from her own. The Guevara's lived like 10 blocks away, or maybe eight, from where I lived. I mean, we, everybody knew who they were. His parents were already a bit eccentric for all the social class into which they had been born. Eccentric because they were socialists, rare for upper-middle-class Argentinians. The thing with Che is he had started reading Marx when he was a kid because he found Marx in his father's library. <laughs> and his father found his copies of Marx annotated by Che when he was 16 or something. But when I ask Lucia de Toledo what defined Che Guevara's ideology, she doesn't say socialism or Marxism. Instead, he had an absolute phobia against imperialism, the Americans. They owned all the banana trade. I mean, if, if you own the banana company and your workers are working terribly long hours and not allowed to be unionized and their children are dying of malnutrition, well, you know, how do you lay that at America's feet? Very easily. You don't have to be Che Guevara to do that. And so Che's feelings towards America? <sighs> Total detestation. Because he saw how... A continent that need not be poor was very poor. Che Guevara's anti-imperialist ideas captivated many Latin Americans. <laughs> I, I read him and I found somebody who was articulating what I thought. I mean, I was surrounded by all these horrible Americans and, and, you know, we were like a colony, for God's sake. And then suddenly we produce this man who looks like us, talks like us and thinks for us. Of course we love him. I found my identity. This is who speaks for me. We have our own music and he made us aware of this. Che Guevara understood the power of propaganda. In the late 50s, after he decided to join Fidel Castro in his fight to overthrow President Batista, they launched a radio station from their base in the Cuban mountains. Pumping songs like this from the rebel quintet and long speeches into people's homes 
they wanted to spread anti-imperialism amongst ordinary Cubans. So when their guerrilla army was victorious in 1959, anti-imperialism had already taken root. Here's the story of just one factory. When the revolution triumphed, anybody who had been involved with the Americans quickly exited. There's a famous story of the Coca-Cola plant uh, shut down, of course, because they all left. And he said, no, you have to start it again because you need the employment. And they said, well, the formula is gone with them. Well, try mixtures and things until you find the Coca-Cola formula and you, we can make Cuba-Cola. And so every day somebody would bring him an, a sample of what they had produced. <laughs> and he would always say, cat's piss. <laughs> and go and try again. So what would a man who defined himself as an anti-imperialist make of the new relationship between Cuba and the US? He would say, about time, they've woken up, they've realized the error of their ways. Because it's the Americans who've realized that their behavior didn't yield them anything and they're now going to change. So Che would welcome the change in US policy towards Cuba, she says. But that assumes that the US has changed its policy. Time for our second expert witness. Part two, imperialism with a smiling face. What has changed is a means. The end, I think, remained the same. This is Professor Louis Perez. While Che Guevara was training his guerrilla army in the mountains, Louis Perez was a teenager growing up in the Upper West Side of New York. It was a working class Caribbean neighborhood, and when the word came that the Cuban Revolution had triumphed and Fulgencio Batista had fled, there was a celebration in the homes and in the streets. Now, Professor Perez is Director of Latin American Studies at the University of North Carolina. He says if you want to know what Che Guevara would make of this new relationship between the US and Cuba, there's a clue in the form of a letter. Take a look at the letter that Fidel Castro wrote in which he uh, grudgingly supports the transition. He recognizes something of an inevitable need for reconciliation with the United States, but continues to be very, very wary. The letter was published in Cuba's state newspaper in January this year. In it, Fidel Castro explains that he supports talks, but doesn't trust U.S. policies. It's hardly surprising. As we've heard, Che Guevara and the Castros built the new Cuba on foundations of independence. The revolution's claim to moral legitimacy and political power was precisely its ability to, uh, to make good on the claim of national sovereignty and self-determination. Because before the revolution, there was a sense that Cuba belonged to the United States, that it was America's playground. Amid a blaze of lights, the cabarets come to life, offering a variety of Latin entertainment. Let merriment reign. These are the ingredients for a fun-filled Havana holiday. There is this historically determined and culturally conditioned belief in the United States that uh, Cuba's destiny belongs to the United States. It was a, a place that developed during the Prohibition as one where one could drink freely, gamble. Basically, Cuba was a tropical island that was out there to serve American pleasure. After President Batista, the U.S.-backed president, was overthrown, everything changed. Well, in a period of 24 months, the new leadership of Cuba turned the purpose of the Cuban government into the service of Cuban interest, that is, Cuba for Cubans. Cuba for Cubans? Not what the U.S. had in mind. Over the next 50 years, the U.S. did everything it could to topple the new government, starting with a blockade in 1960, now the longest trade embargo in history. Behind all this was just one objective the overthrow of the Cuban government. This was the overriding purpose to which U.S. policy was given between 1960 and, and last December. That is to produce economic hardship to make life as difficult as possible for the Cuban people in the hope that the Cuban people would rise up in despair, overthrow the government, and thereby provide the United States with the outcome it desired. 
It was like a relationship that had ended badly. As well as the blockade, there were the less subtle tactics. Assassination plots involving cigars, pen syringes and exploding mollusks. Then there were the more insidious ploys, infiltrating the underground music movement or starting a social network to sow unrest. President Obama might be promising a new relationship, but Louis Perez says the overriding goal is still the same. The new approach seeks to empower the Cuban people, to wean them off dependence on the Cuban government, that they could then serve as an agent, an internal agent, for uh, political change. And if this new relationship leads to the embargo being lifted... Cuba would be overrun with American capital. Cuba would be overrun with American tourists. Cuba would be overrun with American manufactured goods. Now, what remains to be seen is the relationship of the Cuban people to that new social economic environment. So unlike our first expert witness, who says Che Guevara would view Cuba's new relationship with the US as a victory, Luis Perez says Che, like Fidel Castro, would be suspicious. This new relationship could threaten Cuba's founding ideals of independence. But what about Cuba's socialist ideals? Part 3. A Welcome Betrayal When the revolution took over, I, I was, uh, what, 21 years old. And for me, it was the greatest thing that could ever happen in Cuba. Meet our third expert witness, Carmelo Mesa Largo. I will say that 98% of Cubans were in favor of the revolution. But eventually, gradually, uh, many people began disenchanted what was going on and either left or stayed and tried to oppose the regime without success, of course. Carmelo Mesa Largo was one of those who left. He went to the US, where he became professor of economics at the University of Pittsburgh. Cuba has come a long way from its socialist founding principles, he says, but not far enough. Cuba is privatizing. For instance, they announced in 2010 that they had to dismiss uh, 1.8 million workers in the state sector. That's about 36% of, of the labor force of Cuba. Changes, he says, that Che Guevara would oppose. And then there are the new cooperatives, where state employees can take over the administration of their own workplaces, earning their salaries directly, rather than from the state. There are changes in housing, too. Now, it is possible to buy and sell a house. Uh, actually, Cubans could have a second house in the countryside or in the beach. The state uh, maintains ownership of, of the land, but gives 10-year contracts uh, to farmers, and they can invest in the land that he will object to. But it's not the first time that Cuba has flirted with the private sector. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990, Cuba went into a very uh, severe economic crisis, the worst since the Great Depression. Fidel didn't have another alternative so as to introduce reform. For instance, he, he legalized the circulation of the dollar. He uh, expanded significantly foreign tourism. They allow uh, self-employment and also agricultural free markets. Uh, all this uh, have positive effects on the economy. So Fidel, he never really liked uh, the market-oriented reform. He simply didn't have another alternative. And when Cuba's economy improved, Fidel Castro reversed those reforms. Then in 2006, when Raul Castro took over, the experiment began again. Raul have realized a long time ago that that system couldn't continue, but Fidel was in charge, and he couldn't go against Fidel. When he, he took over, gradually he began to implement the reforms. Es decir, que la cuestión que hemos analizado y los errores que hemos criticado no pueden volver a suceder. Se está jugando la vida de la revolución. We cannot make the same mistakes again, said Raúl Castro five years ago. We reform or we sink. Carmelo Mesa Largo says these reforms should be going faster. But even at the current pace, he's clear on what Che would say. I have studied very carefully the thoughts and, and practice 
of Che Guevara, and really, he was a, an idealist, and therefore, he may say that Raúl be, is betraying the revolution. So we have a third reading of Che Guevara, a misguided ideologue who left Cuba in ruins, a man who would feel betrayed by Raúl Castro's reforms and his overtures to the U.S. Our final expert witness has yet another view. Those early days after the 1959 revolution have been misunderstood, he says, and so has Che Guevara. Part 4. A Continuing Revolution Che Guevara's views are uh, misunderstood. We wanted not to impose the Soviet socialist model, but to create a new, different kind of socialist system. And in that socialist system, there was a, a legitimate presence of the private sector. Only in 68, the Cuban Revolution nationalized the remaining small business in Cuba. In other words, the Cuban Revolution lived with the private sector for nine years. He says that it was only after Che Guevara's death that Cuba became more radically socialist. The Cuban Revolution in 1968 had a drive towards a more radical ideological movement. In those years, the question of moving towards a communist society became part of the Cuban agenda in terms of a, we have to build socialism and communism at the same time. That idea became predominant and made Cuba eliminate 60,000 private business that remained there. So Raul Castro's reforms would not be seen as a betrayal by Che Guevara, he says. Instead, they're a return to what he started. What I think Raul Castro is promoting is to make a more decentralized system. And I think that is in the spirit of what Che Guevara wanted, to have a, a public sector that could be more efficient. He says that not only is this side of Che Guevara's socialism forgotten, but so is Che's willingness to talk to the United States. Six years ago, the USD classified a secret memo in which a top aide to the Kennedy administration recounted a meeting with Che Guevara in 1961. Che Guevara is basically saying to the US government, we want make any changes in our system, but we are ready to discuss everything else. In the middle of the, of the Cold War, the message Che Guevara was delivering to the Kennedy administration was, we want peace, we want dialogue, and we want to negotiate. In other words, he's not the ideologue that some have made him out to be. So having heard from all four of our expert witnesses, what would Che say about the new Cuba 
Well, it seems that the way they view Che Guevara mirrors their own views of the 1959 revolution. For biographer Lucia de Toledo, Che's ideas have taken root. Che would say that the Cuban revolution is so firmly entrenched that nobody can take that away from them. Nobody can take their national health service from them. Nobody can take their education from them. I feel very good about it because the revolution is solid. But for Carmelo Mesa Largo, professor of economics in Pittsburgh, Che's revolutionary ideas are dangerous and should be forgotten. In Cuba, no one is thinking about what Che Guevara may think. People simply don't want dreams. They have been supporting this system for 54 years now, and they want to buy things, travel, be able to buy a house. I have traveled all over Latin America and working, and you can see uh, portraits of Che Guevara everywhere. Of course, there is a big portrait of Che Guevara. It's about 10 stories high uh, in the Plaza de la Revolución, in the major uh, square where Fidel used to address the people. Uh, but it's like a joke. This is simply a means of the path. And for Rafael Hernandez, journalist in Havana, Che lives on, and so does his revolution. But it's time to expose it to the outside world. If socialism can only survive within a glass urn, then it is impossible to sustain socialism. This morning, I was attending a panel with a crowd of youngsters, and there were people they are quoting Che Guevara. They are using Che Guevara to talk about our problems. That means that his thinking is alive. His thinking may be alive, but to get to the real man, there are 50 years of myth-making to wade through. Che, the revolutionary hero. Che, the misguided ideologue. Che, the pragmatist. And of course, there are those who would describe him as a ruthless executioner. As a shorthand, or a symbol, Che can probably be made to say most things. But as Cuba begins its search for a new identity, it may be that Che becomes increasingly silent, consigned to the t-shirt rack of a tourist shop, too divisive to be of much use to Cuba's leaders. The Inquiry is produced in London by Simon Mabin, Phoebe Keane and me, James Fletcher. You can listen to previous editions of the show on our website and you can demand an inquiry. Get in touch on the World Service Facebook page or on Twitter. We're at BBC The Inquiry.